I'm excited to be in the middle of a teaching series that we're referring to as Forgotten Virtues. Last week we began and we talked about the idea of, of honor that was uh, particularly applied to, to Veterans Day, and we thank again all of our veterans for, for their service. But today we get to focus on the second of these forgotten virtues, namely gratitude. Next week we'll be looking at, uh, at integrity. Before we go any further, I do want to mention the, the, the concept of gratitude with regard to Thanksgiving. Uh, one of the things that we like to do here at River Hills is to uh, take, take Thanksgiving and spread it across the, the Thanksgiving week. So today we're going to be, be talking about Thanksgiving. Next week we're going to engage in another ancient practice of the church, which is the Thanksgiving feast. Are you familiar with the Thanksgiving feast? In traditional churches, the Thanksgiving feast is referred to as the Eucharist, which is the Greek word for Thanksgiving, otherwise uh, known as the Lord's Supper or Communion. And so one of the things we like to do here at River Hills is to end Thanksgiving week and the Thanksgiving weekend celebrating the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving feast that has been celebrated for over 2,000 years uh, to celebrate what God has done for us. Because if there's anything that's important to, to our faith, it's recognizing and giving thanks for the things that God has got done for us. But I want to set the stage for that today by asking the question, have we forgotten Thanksgiving? Uh, those of you who know me know that Thanksgiving is probably my favorite holiday. Uh, we're at the point with our kids where all of our kids have significant others right now. And it was so cool, uh, several weeks ago, our oldest daughter said, well, Matt and I are talking about how we're going to, to share the holidays with our, with our respective parents. And so we thought we'd, we'd celebrate Christmas with, with you guys and, and celebrate Thanksgiving with Matt. And uh, Debbie said, oh, you know, Dad's favorite holiday is Thanksgiving. Can't you maybe flip those around? And the response was, oh, sure, we can do that. And let's see if I can do this without getting misty. But um, so our kids are coming from all over. Johanna and Milo flew in from San, San Francisco this, this weekend. Milo's out at hunting camp with, with his family. Katrina and Matt are, are, uh, are in Madison, and they're going to be celebrating with us. And Stuart and Haley up in the Twin Cities are, are celebrating with us. So it's just a really, really special time. I know I haven't forgotten Thanksgiving. Okay? But when I look around the culture, I have to wonder if maybe we've forgotten Thanksgiving. You know how hard it was to find a banner that says, give thanks for that, that, that barn door over there? Um, I, I went to stores. There are, in most stores, there, there's nothing for Thanksgiving decorations. So then I thought, I'd go to the big box stores. I went to Michael's. And Michael's has one little table. And I asked one of the people, I said, is this it for, for your Thanksgiving items? And she said, oh, we, we have a couple more things over there on the clearance table if you want to find it. This is like two and a half weeks before Thanksgiving when I'm asking this, this question and I'm sent over to, to the, the clearance aisle, you know? And it didn't matter where I went, but then I realized when I finally found the mother load of, of Thanksgiving decorations at Hobby Lobby, why maybe some people have given up on Thanksgiving decorations, and that's because they look like, like country in the 1980s. Remember? I mean, that stuff definitely comes from the early 80s. And I'm like, why, why, why do we have that? And then I realized what we used to have in our house was some, some gray and blue uh, uh, pilgrims, you know, and they're, they're, what do you do for Thanksgiving? And so we kind of came up with, with this theme over there. How, how do you like that? You know, just, just reminding us of, of, of the bounty of the earth. I wanted to have a deer hanging on a hook uh, this morning when you came in, just to remind us of the bounty of, of the land, but 
the staff voted me down for some reason. So, in any case, uh, do, you, do, you, do you realize, now, that there was, there was something out there. Now, Scott Aker is going to, to dig this because he's totally into decorating for Halloween. But it seems like Thanksgiving is, is the, the, the forgotten meat between two slices of Halloween and Christmas, right? And a few years ago, there was an article that said that, that Halloween is closing in on Christmas in terms of the amount of money spent on decorations. I mean, in my, li- in my lifetime, I've never seen so many Halloween decorations. And I go over to Aker's house, and I have to wonder if he's even a, a Christ follower, you know? I mean, some of the stuff that's, Ugh. I brought my dog over there, and this, this werewolf started growling at my dog, and, and, and Finn started growling back, and it was kind of a humorous deal. But, but I have to say this, Scott, you're going to be disappointed, but actually, Halloween is in like eighth position right now in terms of the amount of money spent. And of course, we think that Christmas is the number one consumer spending deal, but you know what it actually is on a per, on a per spender basis? Back to college. Back to college, people spend about $970 uh, per spender. But that's not all of us in the room, right? But then Christmas comes at about uh, $857 per spender. And we have to realize that Valentine's Day comes in February, and that's way up there as well. And then comes Mother's Day, which far outstrips Father's Day, and, and then comes Halloween, and I think it's seventh or, or eighth position. I have to put the bar graph up there for, for the others. But, you know, there are some people who, who, who are trying to, to assign generational blame for this, that, that millennials just aren't thankful people. They're, they're, they're just totally entitled and Xers, you know, and Y. And I'm like, you know what? It's not a generational thing. I think it's a human thing. I think we have forgotten thanksgiving, not because it's a generational thing, but because it's a human thing. I want to invite you to turn in your Bible to Jesus talking about this very issue. Um, In Luke chapter 17, Matthew, Mark, Luke, I'm reminding myself, um, it's the third book of the New Testament. And Matthew, Mark, Luke 17, uh, we come upon a story where, where Jesus heals these ten guys. Let me just read you the passage. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And you'll remember that Samaria was where a lot of uh, people who were, were half-Jewish lived. And these were, were people who, when they were exiled from, from Israel, they went and they intermarried. And as a result of, of that, true Jews didn't regard Samaritans as, uh, as anyone that they wanted to associate with. And so here's Jesus walking the line between the Samaritans, and the, the Jewish people. And verse 12, as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have, have pity on us. Now you remember if You were with us a a few weeks ago. I spoke uh, at uh, some length about leprosy, and it's not what leprosy is considered today. Uh, Doctors aren't quite sure what is being identified here, but it was a contagious skin condition. It was a debilitating skin condition. It was a highly contagious skin condition, so that people who, who had this, who were identified as having or potentially having it, were exiled from living in the village and uh, sent across the river to Roxbury. Um, if you ever had, had your, your question about people who lived in Rock, I'll, I'll do respect to the Ludolfs, um, but in, in any case, you, you, you get the idea. They, they were exiled from town 
outside of the main gates, and there were leper colonies outside. And whenever someone was, was walking in their vicinity, they were required to call out and warn people, hey, I'm a leper. Be careful. Can you imagine how that would make you feel? And so they hear about Jesus, they see Jesus, and they call out to him, Jesus, Master, or Lord, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, and now here are the red letters, go, show yourselves to the priests. Now, what's that about? I mean, it's like, go to church, you know. Wait, 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 don't, 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 don't. don't. Go into the temple. Don't, don't go to the priest right now. You're, you're, you're a leper. You couldn't even get there. But that was code. Jesus was saying, something's going to happen. If you listen to me, if you act on faith, something is going to happen. Go show yourself to the priests because if someone suspected that they had been healed of their leprosy, that their leprosy had passed, then they were to, to go and, and be certified. To, it's almost like registering a, a deer carcass right? You, you, you had to go and register your own carcass be, as, as being clean now. Go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, notice what these next words are, they were cleansed. So as they acted in faith by, by turning away from Jesus, not, not depending upon like a physical touch or something that they expected from him, they acted in faith on, on his word, there, there, there's a whole separate message there, isn't it? Isn't there? They acted on faith on his word and did what he asked of them. But now here's where it really applies to what we're talking about today. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And if, if you have your electronic version, you know, hi, highlight some of those words. One of them, right? One of them came back. Notice he was praising him. He throws himself at Jesus' feet. And then please, please highlight and thanked him. And thanked him. Now, Luke isn't going to let us get away with just reading this. He is going to emphasize something very important. And he says, oh, and by the way, the dude who thanked Jesus was the one who all the Jews hated. He was a, a Samaritan. Luke points that out very specifically. And he was the Samaritan. I wonder sometimes if maybe our religiosity is one of the things that uh, drives us to not give thanks for the things for which we should be thankful. I mean, that, that, that to me is kind of a mind blower. But is that, is that what we're supposed to learn from this passage? This is, a, this is a very, very intriguing little paragraph, isn't it? Because there, there isn't a whole lot of... of principles being taught here. There, there, there are questions being raised, and, and that's kind of the Jewish way of teaching, to, to, to raise questions. And well, One question is, only one out of ten? Well, only one out of ten are thankful for having their life saved? Only one out of ten? And a Samaritan who is despised? And then verse 17 Luke reports that Jesus said this, we're not all ten cleansed? <laughs> Jesus is like, oh, you mean maybe the miracle didn't work after all? No, 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 that's not what he meant. We're not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise, to give thanks to God, except, and he, he, he underscores that this is not a Jewish individual, except this foreigner. And then he encourages him to get up off of his knees 
verse 19. And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, I, I wonder if maybe what happens to us is what I mentioned earlier, and it's not assigned to, to millennials, it's not assigned to Xers or Gen Z, it's not assigned to any of that. But maybe in this passage, we're, we're, we're to ask ourselves, has my own, has my own faith, has my own religion, has my own relationship with my God caused me to take it for granted? Caused me to feel entitled? You see, because the opposite of thanksgiving is entitlement. And it might not be a generational thing, but I do think it's a cultural thing. I mean, I think it's, it's a cultural thing here in our country. Do, do, do you agree? That the whole idea of, of entitlement? We thought it was funny. We were going through some, uh, some, some music equipment as, uh, as our oldest daughter was moving into her own house and wanting to, to come across some of her, her music possessions and there, there, there was a, a blue ribbon, and those of you who, who know, Katrina knows that she's an oboe player, and she was pretty accomplished as an oboe player. And so we said, oh, here's your blue ribbon. And she, turned, she, she, she flipped it over, and she said, this isn't mine. This is Stuart's. And we all broke out laughing. Because if there's anything that Stuart was never good at, and Stuart, if you're watching right now, I'm sorry. But actually, I'm the one who forced you to quit. Um, it was music. If there's anything he wasn't good at, it was music. And we're like, how in the world did someone give him a blue ribbon? You know? And if, if, if you've been in sports, you, 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 guys, you guys have been in sports. Remember when, when you were a little kid and, and all, all, all the parents would come running out at, at halftime or, or between games? Uh, and... They, they, they'd ply you with, like, cupcakes and, and high-C juice boxes as if what you need are, like, you know, mega doses of carbohydrates that are just going to make you sleepy and tired, you know? But, but we, we, we thought we should do that, and, and I remember it was like, it was like the battle of, of, of the, the, the refreshments, and we had to come up with the best thing so, so that everybody would be impressed with the, the refreshments that, that we brought out, and you'd bring them out, and... and and these bunch of smelly boys and, and very well, well-scented women um, would, would, would be, you know, just shoving their, their mouths with, with the food and no one would say thank you. There was a sense of entitlement, I think, that, that we have, have raised up in, in our world and we need to really, really take a look at that. We need to really, really take a look at, at, at ourselves and ask, you know, how... In what ways do I feel entitled in my relationships with other people? Now, I'm not saying anything against what we talked about last week in honoring people, but I wonder if, if we, we, we just expect to, to be placed on a pedestal just because of who we are or who we think we are. I don't know, I'm, I'm wondering along with you. But I have to look at what Jesus says and just say, where, where would I be? Would I be one of the, would I be the one or would I be one of the nine? And does my sense of entitlement push thanksgiving away? Does it? I want to draw your attention to another passage of Scripture. It's something that um, is probably the classic Thanksgiving text. In fact, if you, if you read on the first Thanksgiving uh, at Plymouth Plantation in, on, on the East Coast in Massachusetts, just off Cape Cod, um, I, I'd encourage you this week to, to reread that story. But Psalm 100 was, uh, was one of those psalms that, that 
form the foundation for Thanksgiving worship. And it begins like this. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Just like what we did earlier in the service. Know that the Lord is God. It's he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And I had kind of a, of, a, of a revelation when I was preparing for this, this message. And that revelation was, was this. You look at Psalm 100 verse 4 and it says, Enter into his gates with Let me read it again. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with with praise. And so I always thought that it was like an obligation when when you come to church to to have an attitude of, of thanksgiving. But then this week, it struck me a whole different way. And looking at the text, I'm like, oh, I wonder if I've been reading this wrong all this time. Maybe what we should look at that verse and think, it's thanksgiving that brings us into the presence of God. It's not an obligation for us at the door to to, to switch from yelling at our family to to, to giving thanks, right? Um, Sorry, I, I know what it was like to... Bring kids to, well, actually, I don't know what it was like to bring kids to church because I only brought one, and that was Stuart. My wife usually brought all the kids to church. Debbie brought all the kids to church. But I've heard stories, okay? I've heard stories. And, but you see where I'm going with this? That thanksgiving brings us into the presence of God. Have you ever had that, that feeling that I, I, I want more of God? I'd like to sense his presence more in my life. I, I, I wish that, that, that somehow I could, I could feel more connected because sometimes it feels like my prayers just bounce off the ceiling. But maybe it's because when we come to God, we, we, we come with this I want attitude. We come with maybe even an entitled attitude. God, I deserve this. God, I deserve a better relationship with with this person and with that person. I deserve this person's respect. I, 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 I deserve these things. And I think what the psalmist is is telling us here is that when we give thanks, we are entering into the very gates. That when when our heart, when our disposition is one of thanks, that things begin to change. Gratitude brings us into the presence of God. Now, let let me explain how this might work. Um, Believe it or not, I have some relationships that aren't the greatest, okay? I know everyone thinks that everybody likes me, um, but that, 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 that's not the case, right? And I, I can come to God, and if I'm going to pray about those, those relationships, I, I can pray all the problems on the other person. Or I could pray all the problems on me. What's wrong with me? Or, God, I know exactly what's wrong with him, you know? And Scott, I'm motioning in your, in your direction, but it has nothing to do with you, okay? It, Tom is back there, too, and so is Milo. So, um, <laughs> but, but what if, what if, rather than, than, than praying in that direction, I give thanks for the fact that I even have a relationship with that individual? I, I, I give thanks that, that for X number of years, I had the opportunity to interact with that individual. Maybe they've cut me off or maybe I've cut them off for, for, for the past weeks or months or years. And, and maybe what I need to do 
is to give thanks for that person and for that relationship. Now, what I'm saying might sound totally bizarre, but um, I, I really do believe that this is where we need to direct our thinking because gratitude also frees us. Gratitude brings us into the presence of God and it frees us. And I think this is why the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the church at Thessalonica, says, in every circumstance, find something to be thankful for. For this is, what's the next two words? This is God's will for you. This is what God wants of you. He wants you to be a thankful person. And when you are a thankful person, you come into his presence. Gratitude frees us from guilt, from anxiety, from withdrawing. So there, 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 are, there are two neural pathways in the body. There, there are multiple, multiple, multiple neural pathways in the body, but the two that, that I want to, to speak to right now is a neural pathway that, that, that brings us closer to a person. We, we, I, I want to move toward Larry in, in my relationship. You've, you, you've all sensed this, right? And then there are neural pathways that, that cause us to withdraw from relationships. We, we, we get a feeling of, of angst. We, 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 we have... These, these physical reactions, maybe it's a sweaty palm. Maybe it's our heart rate that, that increases. So ne neural pathway drawing in, another neural pathway withdrawing. Very important in human relationships. Now, I got to say that I love geeking out on this. This journey that I've been on, on for the past, going on 12 months now, has been one of the most fascinating journeys of my life. And it's caused me to, to, to look at so many different things. First thing that I looked at was my relationship with food and my, my relationship with activity. And uh, that changed everything. And then in March and April, I came across this individual. His name is Andrew Huberman. He's, he's a PhD. He's a doctor of, and an MD. He's, he's a doctor of ophthalmology and neurobiology at Stanford. And he has a podcast referred to as the Huberman Lab Podcast. And one of the things that caught my attention a couple months ago when I started preparing for this message was that Andrew Huberman not only spoke to how I could uh, uh, develop new, new practices and protocols in my life with regard to eating and with regard to, to exercise and with regard to, to, to mindset, but then he comes along and, and he, he has this, this, this episode on best gratitude practices. And you can see there it's about a hundred, uh, one hour, 26 minutes long. And what you need to know about Andrew Huberman is that he doesn't just pull stuff out of thin air, but everything that he talks about is, is based on, on research. And so when I was talking to you just now about these neural pathways, that's something that I've, I've learned from, from Dr. Huberman. And he makes science very, very accessible and very, very practical for us. And I, I'd encourage you this week to, to go on YouTube or whatever your favorite podcast uh, medium might be and, and check out Best Gratitude Practices. Because it's... It's really kind of life-changing. One of the things that, that he points out is that our, our relationship to, to gratitude changes our relationship to other people. And if we are thankful for our relationship, and if we are generally thankful for the things that, that happen, if, and, and sometimes you have, to, you have to reach, you have to grasp for for this, okay? But as, as we are thankful, we, we move toward that individual. There, there, there are repairs that are made, and th those, those reparations are mutual. 
Because as we move in that direction, as we are thankful, there, there, there is some kind of, of, of communication or communication changes between us. So one of the things that, that we can do in terms of uh, best gratitude practice is, is a, the, the, the expected one, right? To, to give thanks. But now, one of the things that, that science has looked at over the past few years is neurobiology. And it just so happens that my oldest daughter is dating someone in the area of neurobiology. And he, he's testing uh, for how the brain fires when certain things are said, how narrative and literature affects uh, our, our neural pathways. And this is something that, that Dr. Huberman talks about. He says, now, we, we, we think that, that giving thanks is, is the, the, the number one thing to do, but if we really want to have the maximum benefit in, in the body that God designed, and it's very interesting listening to him because I don't think he's a Christ follower, but he does believe that, that this world was designed. He says, what we need to do is not just give thanks, but we, we, we get the biggest payback in receiving thanks. Now, that, that too makes sense, doesn't it? Doesn't it make you feel good, Holly, when someone just says, thank you? I love you for who you are. I love you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Holly, you know what? You, you are one of the most thoughtful people in sending thank you notes. And I love it when I get one of your notes. So the chief benefiter right now was Holly. And one of the things that we need to also do in terms of, of upping the ante with regard to how we practice gratitude in our life is not just give thanks, not just receive thanks, because what if you're just kind of a jerky person, right? What, what, what if nobody ever wants to say thank you to you because of who you are or what you do, because everything that you do is kind of selfish, you know? But, but, but you want to turn that corner. What can you do? And one of the things that, uh, that these neurobiologists have, have discovered when they have people in the, the MR, MNRI, did I say that right? Um, is they, you, you can find stories that cause you to be thankful. Stories that cause you to be thankful. Watch this on the side screens for just a second. This is from October 8th. There's good news tonight about victories Can you turn on this up, please? and off the field. And a young man who wasn't expected to survive reaching his dream of playing football. At William Fleming High School in Roanoke, Virginia, something special happened on the football field last month. The players and coaches took teamwork to a whole new level by including 17-year-old Tyree Tasco, a senior with lifelong health challenges who always dreamed of scoring a touchdown. This is tackle somebody. There he is, number 21. You can see and hear players from both teams cheering him on and helping guide him towards the end zone before the big celebration. The moment, a milestone for Tyree's mom, Carolyn. She adopted him and says he was so ill, doctors feared he might not make it. Tyree is such a, an, a really an inspiration. I got Tyree at nine months of age. And the night that I got him, they said, oh, he probably wouldn't live through the night. They had diagnosed him then, failure to thrive. It seemed like every three days we were going to somebody's doctor's appointment. And I just never gave up. Carolyn's faith, a bedrock of that determination. He is a miracle yeah. child. Yes. She also credits the team for their compassion. Did you hit your dance? Did you hit your dance? Colonel's coach, Jamar Lovelace, helped set up the big surprise. This is a young man who has faced so much adversity and yet 
is focused on the future and there's really nothing that he cannot do. He's been defined the odds his whole life. What was so important for us and our players uh, was to give him an opportunity to do something that is kind of his lifelong dream. That game inspiring Tyree's teammates, Jalen Robinson and Kaya Nesbitt too. What was it like to see Tyree do that? It was a very special moment just to see him, how excited he was. I'm going to remember that moment for the rest of my life. One team setting an example about what winning really means. I think that big message is that, uh, you know, someone may not look like you, uh, may have different struggles than you, um, but, 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 you know, dreams can come true for everybody. And we just found out Tyree was honored last night at the game as senior class king. Big congrats to him. No. Don't you love stories like that? Can we give a hand to the Roanoke High School football team? I don't know if you heard the, uh, the, the, the line that just kind of flew by, but uh, it was Tyree's faith that got him through. I don't know if you saw his smile and his, his, his disposition when he was in the hospital bed all bandaged up. That smile said it all. To me, it was, thank you. Thank you for another fresh start. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for making this, this available to me. And so, what do you do with that? Well, I know one thing. There, there, there were 1,700 comments on YouTube this morning when I checked to see how, how it had been going. And you know what 1,500 of the comments were about? It wasn't about the bridge being uh, blown up in, in Russia that led the news that night. It wasn't any of the other stories. It was the Tyree story that generated 1,500 comments. And what's so great about that is that people are, are, are taking a story that makes them feel thankful for the world in which we live, makes them feel thankful for people around us who do care, makes us feel thankful for coaches who will, who will inspire the, the, the rest of the team and not simply bench a person uh, for their entire career, but help make a dream possible. It, you, you, you see where I'm going with this? This is a story that inspires thankfulness. And if we want to, to in, improve our general disposition in life, thankfulness is the way to do it, to, to find these stories and to remember these stories and to rehearse these stories. And when you find someone who's in a bad way, even in this room right now, look around and if you find them in a bad way, say, do you remember that Tyree story that, that we saw at church? I think it was on the NBC Evening News on Saturday, October 8th, the 5.30 p.m. news. Let's go YouTube it. And recalling those things for which we can be thankful changes our neural pathways. You see, this is the way God has designed us. Enter into his gates with the key of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving opens it up, and so we can rehearse them. And is it any wonder why next week we are rehearsing the greatest story ever told? What is that greatest story? We call it the Thanksgiving feast, which in Greek is the word, say it loudly, come on. It's the Eucharist. It's, it's the Thanksgiving meal. And so we rehearse these stories that make us thankful. And this is why we gather together weekly in worship. And I want to end with one last gratitude practice that we can do. And that is, to recall scripture verses and songs that remind you of God's goodness and your thankfulness. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Amber, would you come up here and help me with something? One of the things that, uh, it just springs back into my mind. Ron Johnson, I'm going to ask you to come up here for a second too. I'm sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm calling you out. And band, we're going to do something before, the, before you guys help us. But there, there, there's an old song, and Ron, you're, you're going to remember this. Well, that was a year ago. 
and today we can be thankful that you're here. Ron, Ron came up, I thought, it, I thought it was just kind of a little snarky thing he was saying to me, saying a year ago I had a heart attack, I don't want to be up on the platform. But it was a year ago you had a heart attack and you are here with us today. Let's thank God for Ron being here with us because it was a big deal. And Ron, you, you know this song. Band, we're not going to use you on this because Ron and I are so good. We are going to sing this song. But because you see, there's a gratitude practice. Do you have a song that, that reminds you of your thankfulness to God? Here's a gratitude practice. Amber, you know this song too. You went to a Baptist school and sang this a lot. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Join us if you know this. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. There are times when I'm driving down the road and that song comes to me. And you see, this is, this is a gratitude practice. As, as you commit things to, to memory or they just come to you, it, it improves the neural pathway. I, I feel better singing that song. Thanks, Ron. Here's another one, Ron, you might know. It's from the 70s. You, you, you can sit down, but help, help us as, as we sing this. I was driving to a conference. I was speaking in Ohio. And... Uh, I wasn't sure all that I was going to be talking about, but uh, this song came on. Uh, it was the Maranatha Singers on my, on my cassette. And uh, do you remember cassettes, you know? And I think this one was stuck in there because I heard this song again and again and again and again. And we're going to sing this song right now. And it's a song that uh, caused me as I drove for the next 100 miles to essentially just be singing it and crying and remembering the gratitude that I had in my heart for, for all things. Not just my, my relationship with, with God in Christ, but my relationship with my family. See, this is how those neural pathways in our lives which might be scarred or might, might be driving us away from someone can bring us to be drawn toward that other person. We're going to talk a little bit more about this next week because you know what else happens? The other person can physically change. The other person can physically change as we share stories together. As, as people are read the same story and they're in two separate biometric uh, reading devices, their respiration becomes identical. Their brain firing starts to match and the things that drove them apart are no longer there. Isn't it amazing how God has designed us? Gratitude. Thanksgiving. The greatest holiday. I don't care how much people don't spend on it. Let's stand up and we're going to sing this song together. Give, Give thanks with, with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. God, our prayer is that that thanksgiving might be the bedrock of, of who we are in worship, who we are in our relationships with, with other people. God, I am so thankful for each person in this room. I am so thankful.
for the family that you've given to me. For my wife, for my kids, for the significant others that you've brought into their lives. And God, we all know in this room, we all know in our, in our relationships, we, we, we know that everything doesn't go the way that we want to. But God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to find books of thankfulness that we can have for every person that you bring across our path. And God, that that might make all the difference, not only in our life, but in theirs. And God, if we want to encourage our community to be kind, then we need to be thankful for each person that you bring across our path in this community and let them know it. And we sing this song again to you in praise. Amen. Give thanks with the grace